Thanks, Wayne. Uh, can people hear me okay with this? Uh, hello, my name's uh, Ashok Mather. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I uh, just want to say a, a, a couple of notes here on some music from somewhere. You get music from back there. Is it? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, Margaret Waterchi for opening uh, opening this uh, today. I'm, I'm very appreciative here to be uh, uh, on the territory of Siksika Nation, Sutina, and, and Stony Nations, which of course come together here in uh, Calgary itself, uh, a city that uh, could be seen as a type of a uh, type of a monument, as Jimmy as Jimmy mentioned. Uh, we're going to start with uh, with the presentations here today, but first let me. Uh, let me say that uh, uh, thank you to, to Wayne and Jen particularly for inviting both Neil McLeod and myself here to act as ongoing moderators over the next four days, uh, a type of, I suppose, animateurs to, to keep conversations going, particularly in that difficult trans uh, transition when we go to Saskatoon because uh, some of the people are, uh, that are here won't be there and vice versa. Uh, and I do encourage people to take a look and, and follow us through on, on live stream and, and you stream uh, because uh, we, can, we can have a sense of what's, uh, what's going on uh, through, the, through the conference. I think uh, Jimmy gave us some very interesting thoughts as, as always, some, some provocative thoughts on, on the notions of monuments, uh, the notion that every monument in the Americas is a, is a, acts as a violence towards indigenous peoples. Uh, the fact that dams and highways, and as I suggest, cities and, the, and their, their skyscapes themselves can be acting as monuments, uh, and the notions of, uh, of <laughs> monumentality as stupidity, which I think is, is something that uh, is an open challenge to us all. I, I hope over the next, uh, next uh, four days, too, that we, uh, we take it upon ourselves to challenge each other, uh, not to fall into this, this passive uh, notion of acceptance, but to understand that we're coming at these from very different perspectives and that we should be uh, t taking the risks that are necessary to, to move us all forward. i also also very appreciative of Jimmy. Moving past that uh, very dangerous and I think very uh, limiting binary of, uh, of the white and indigenous or the white and black, as he said, that the idea that uh, to, to create an inclusive environment where racialized perspectives are are, are necessary because of those varied and, and variegated uh, positions of colonial uh, history. So I think it's, uh, it's really wonderful to, to conceptualize that as we, as we begin our, our discussions. The, the topic here is who's heroes? Why do monuments matter? And we have uh, on the panel, we have uh, uh, five speakers. We have uh, Kathy Mattis, uh, we have Maria Teresa Alves who will be joining us via Skype and she'll be uh, starting a video in a moment. Paul Chat Smith, is sitting two seats over. Uh, Jeff Thomas, who's at the end, who show uh, where the children will be seen tonight at the Glenbow, and Jeffrey Gibson, just uh, just next to Kathy here, who of course has the show uh, next uh, next door, uh, and, and I think he might be talking a bit about that. Uh, when Jen was talking to me about this, uh, we were talking a bit about what monuments are and the fact that sometimes they be they they remain invisible in certain contexts until there's a moment of crisis. The notion of the toppled monument. Uh, and so my question, I suppose, as we start this off is, uh, uh, do we need these monuments? And, and what is the challenge to the, the reconsideration of what they are and what they do for us? And, uh, and how can we move against that uh, in a necessary way? The question of who's heroes is a bit more challenging to me, too. I, I don't know if we need heroes. Often the, the notion of heroes is predicated on, on the unfortunate deaths and, uh, and a type of hyper-patriotism and nationalism that doesn't really associate itself with what I would like to see in, in terms of heroism, which is uh, to support uh, and to, to be kind and to be in an environment where we need to uh, protect one another, which is a, it's a very different, different sensibility. So with that uh, brief introduction, uh, what I'm going to do is, is turn it over to, we're going to start with uh, Maria Teresa Alves' uh, video and then we'll, we'll move with each speaker for about 10 minutes. Then we'll have a bit of a cross-conversation on the panel, of conversations and questions coming up from here before we turn it over to, uh, over to the audience. So can we start then with, uh, with the video from Maria? convidada para participar na exposição feito por brasileiros no extinto Hospital Matarazzo, na cidade de São Paulo. Nasci lá e o meu pai trabalhava para os Matarazzos. 
Depois que eu terminei a minha instalação Eu e os Matarazos, em que denuncio os bandeirantes, eu li o ensaio do catálogo por o novo dono do imóvel, Alexandre Allard, em que artistas são comparados favoravelmente com os bandeirantes. Encontrei com membros da comunidade Guarani, de Tonon de Porã, em São Paulo, e perguntei o que eles pensavam sobre os bandeirantes e artistas. Então, isso eu não entendi como é assim, né? Os artistas contemporâneos, né? São os novos bandeirantes. Ah, são... As, uh, são pessoas que destruíram muitos, muitos territórios indígenas. Mataram, caçaram e mataram. Do, é, dominaram territórios imensos de povos indígenas, de diferentes nações, diferentes culturas, línguas, que eles têm como hoje uma história, uma, um, um retrato desses feitos de assassinatos, estupros, violências física, espiritual e territorial, assim, eles vêm, são ditos no Brasil como debravadores, aqueles que foram heróis, que foram corajosos e que depravaram, as, é, que abriram matas, que construíram, que encaminharam a construção das grandes cidades, como São Paulo, por exemplo. Mas, então, na, na verdade, para a gente indígena, eles são nossos, tipo, nossos primeiros agressores ferozes, assim, de grande, em grande massa, assim. Foi, foi tipo, um dos grupos que assassinou muitos povos, destruiu muitas aldeias de formas muito ruins. E hoje no Brasil, não, não, nesse país, a gente tem retratos disso com construções, com aparecimentos de monumentos em muitas partes de São Paulo, assim, em ruas uh, mais conhecidas, como na Avenida Paulista, que a gente tem uh, estátuas sempre com erguidos, que mostra a virilidade deles, que mostra a força, que mostra a coragem pela forma de como estão as estátuas. E a gente nunca vê eles como heróis, mas sim, sempre como assassinos, assim, que destruíram de novo, repito, muitas aldeias indígenas de muitas etnias. E eu não, não entendo muito quando ele tenta fazer uma comparação desse, desse mundo artístico hoje contemporâneo com, essa, com, com novos bandeirantes. E aí, por não conhecer muito, não posso falar muito, mas... Penso que, como em todas as organizações do ser humano, assim, de como se expressar no mundo artístico, também deve ter, de fato, muitas formas, às vezes, pejorativas, por ignorância, ou formas de raci racistas de, de expor o trabalho e tal, através de, de desenhos, de monumentos e tal. Talvez esteja relacionado a isso, talvez. Infelizmente, a visão que o brasileiro tem dos bandeirantes é uma visão é, detupada, que não é real. Essa visão tem porque o, o, povo, o povo brasileiro, a história brasileira é contada pelos vencedores. E quem venceu a guerra por território, foram os bandeirantes, foram os não indígenas, os europeus. Né? Por isso que existe essa, é, como eu posso falar, é, louvação aos, aos, aos bandeirantes que são considerados heróis. Né? Isso na visão, na visão europeia, na visão portuguesa, na visão dos vencedores da guerra, é uma visão correta para eles, mas não para nós que somos indígenas, que somos nativos. Para nós, os bandeirantes são algozes, 
Para nós, os bandeirantes escravizaram, estuparam e fizeram ah, absurdos por conta de uma ganância. Por ganância, por riqueza, por ouro, por território. Né? A, nossa, a nossa visão da história é muito diferente da visão da história do não indígena, do Juruá. Por isso é que eu acredito que o Alexandre Alda Aldi, Aldi escreveu isto. Comparando os, os artistas aos bandeirantes, ele quer dizer que são é, debravadores, como é que é essa palavra? É, são pioneiros, são os primeiros, são os que vão é, des, destrinchar a mata. Né? Mas o é, que, que, que ele não percebe é que para destrinchar a mata você derruba e passa por cima de pessoas, e passa por cima de população, passa por cima de cultura, passa por cima de religião, passa por cima de modo de ser e de viver. Acredito que essa visão deturpada, diferente, né, é por conta da própria história do Brasil, que ela é, foi contada sempre pelos, pelos mais ricos, sempre pelos europeus, sempre pelos vencedores. Né. Tentar comparar ah, os, os artistas aos bandeirantes e dizer que, esses, que essa arte vem do povo, da periferia, que vem da... Da, da população mais pobre é uma contradição é uma contradição em termos então eu acho que realmente é como ele pode até ter tido uma boa intenção uma, uma um bom é, como é que eu posso dizer achar que estava falando um elogio né mas depende para quem ouve eu que ouço não não escuto como elogio né? Não sei o que os artistas brasileiros, contemporâneos e não brasileiros, vão se sentir quando serem comparados aos bandeirantes. And thank you so much for that. Um, uh, Maria, I wonder if uh, you want to say a couple of words, uh, if we can get uh, Ron to Skype to, just to, to, to add some context to that, Do you have a, if you have a couple of minutes. Uh, yes, I could. Um, uh, I wanted to say that that statue, that last image was of a statue that's um, it's called Monument to the Bandeiras, which is to the Bandeirantes, and that's very close. It's walking distance from the building where the São Paulo Biennale is held. And uh, it's an extremely aggressive statue out there. Earlier this year, there was a protest by the Guarani community of that statue. And of course, there was an uproar from the white Brazilian um, society about uh, uh, questioning this, what is considered a heritage, a national cultural heritage, and uh, of questioning that it's a monument to genocide. And uh, it was very ill received by Brazilian society, this protest. And we have to remember that uh, Brazil, as that um, uh, photograph shows, Brazil mem commemorates November 14th, uh, just passed, uh, the day of the Bandeirantes. And the Bandeirante is nothing more than a killer, uh, an enslaver of indigenous people. Because in that statue that you briefly saw, uh, there are chained uh, native people that the Bandeirantes, there's two of them in the front, they're on the horses, and they're leading uh, enslaved native people. And so there's an uh, uh, active celebration in Brazil of, the, of a, the myth of nation building different from the U.S., whereas the U.S. has the cowboy and therefore has an idea of a passive aggressive killer. And other places have a, the celebration of the myth of the settler or the pioneer, which is a passive killer. Then we have which has uh, the native included the nation uh, myth building and uh, the monuments to uh, Aztec uh, leaders who were the oppressors of many people in Mexico. And in Brazil, it's very different. It's a celebration of the aggressive killer, uh, the pure killer. And, um, there is uh, this monument to Bandeirantes, 
they found a museum of art of Sao Paulo, which is on Avenida Paulista, and this is the monument that Gera was thinking about, of a very sort of Bandeiranchi standing uh, feet apart, fists, uh, hands made into balls of uh, fists. And he says, I will succeed or I will die trying. And what he did was uh, he um, destroyed native villages in search for for gold and he celebrated and he's right in front across the street from the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo and no one has thought from the white Brazilian society that perhaps this is something that we need to be discussing if we're going to go into the 21st century. Um, there's also another statue of the Bandeirante that is extremely offensive in uh, Mato Grosso do Sul uh, where you have, I have a tangerine, make believe this is a bag of gold and you have the they don't hold this ball looking at it, and at, the, at his feet is a native person. None of this is being discussed in Brazil, and the first discussion, small discussion, was by the Guarani community, who are very uh, uh, few amount of people in Sao Paulo, and the Brazilian society did not reciprocate in the discussion of this. Okay, thank you so much, Rio. A very powerful. Thank you so much. Uh, 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 notion of uh, re resistance that, that Jeremy was referring to earlier and a, a reconceptualizing of what, uh, what it might be to, to rethink what, what uh, the notion of the hero is, of course. Uh, I, I hope we can come back to this because I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a wonderful intervention into, uh, that can lead us into a lot of uh, very important spaces. So I think what I'm going to do now is move over to, to Kathy. And I think, Kathy, are you going to go up to the podium to... Okay, okay, we'll do it that way then. Go ahead, Kathy. Can everyone hear me? Is it good? Tang Shi Kyo Ao, Kathy Mattis, to Shim Nikhao Shun, a Spruce Woods Manitoba Nui Kin, Maxi to the organizers uh, for this wonderful conference uh, and the panelists I'm with, and to the keepers of this land and this territory, Marci. Uh, today I want to discuss how Manitoba public monuments of Riel have become vessels for gendered actions and narratives of Métis, myself included. I just want to make sure right there. <laughs> <laughs> Image one, please. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you. Um, I wanted to examine this topic and how it relates to an exhibition I curated in 2001 at the Winnipeg Art Gallery called Realisms, and some more recent engagements with uh, the myth of Riel. Primarily, uh, I hope I have time to talk about the recent performance by artist and scholar David Garneau. Uh, Franco-Manitoban artist Marcien Lemay's monument was created for the Manitoba Centennial celebrations. It was commissioned, um, or its commission was initiated by La Société Louis Riel, uh, which was led by Métis MLA, NDP MLA Jean Lard. And there were 22 male members who paid 20 bucks for the prestige to be involved in the society, which uh, his goal was to erect a monument uh, of Riel in recognition of him being the founder of, of Manitoba. And some of the people involved were priests, ambassadors, uh, one of the leading members of the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood. Out of 22, 19 were non-Indigenous. And this exhibition uh, was placed at the legislative uh, grounds. Uh, can you switch? It's worth noting this depiction that was submitted to La Société Luriel. This is by Herbert Garner. And I feel it appears more in tune with Métis narratives of Riel being the strong Métis leader who worked hard to resist and stop the actions of uh, nation state development as it was occurring. It seems to reflect some Métis oral storytelling about Riel being this leader who held on to the surveyor's chain and attempted to stop the development of the railroad, asserting Métis culture into a public monument. So my question is, why not this one uh, at that time? Uh, slide? I'm so old school. Image? <laughs> <laughs> Terms like grotesque, incongruous monstrosity, coupled with racist assertions that there should be no commemoration of Riel because he was a madman traitor and rebel Métis leader, continued through the years to the point that the Manitoba Métis Federation demanded its removal and relocation to Collège Saint Boniface, and that a depiction that presents Louis Riel as a statesman uh, be put in LeMay's sculpture's place. Image? This was the image that was chosen. This is by uh, artist uh, Miguel Joyal. 
Marcia LeMay initially was a commission to create the replacement. It was kind of a deal. Let us move your piece that we think is an incongruous monstrosity and bothers us, and we'll give you the commission to do a states and one as how we want him to be seen. Note, he doesn't look like Herbert Garner's, right? In an action of resistance, he's very much a statesman, similar to other monuments where um, Canadian heroes look like bankers, right? Um, <laughs> but LeMay and MLA Jean Lard, they chained themselves to uh, his abstracted piece when it was being removed. I think it was just a knee-jerk emotional response. And because of that, the MMF, of course, felt that the contract between Marcel Lemay and the MMF was null and void. So Marcel Lemay, I mean, Miguel Joyel, uh, was commissioned for this particular piece. Now, in revisiting my research for my 1998, oh my gosh, MA thesis titled Whose Hero? Images of Louis Riel in Contemporary Art in Métis Nationhood, I found that the actions by certain Métis leaders in erecting and then removing LeMay's monument seemed to ignore the vital roles that women played in the resistance of 1870 and in Batoche in 1885. Métis women played and continue to now vital and important roles that have been minimalized within our nation. For example, at the time of Riel, Marguerite Caron told Riel during the Battle of Fish Creek uh, to reinforce uh, Métis forces or she was going to do it herself. Another uh, woman, Marie Anne Parenteau, told Father Fermont in Saint Laurent that if the police or soldiers came, she would skin them like buffalo. Um, Eleanor Thomas Garneau scrubbed away um, remnants of some of Riel's letters while a Northwest Mounted Police Sergeant and four constables came to her home with a search warrant and warrant for the arrest of her husband, Lawrence Garneau. While he was in prison, she was left alone with 11 children. Uh, during the Battle of Batoche, Métis women also did things like melt lead to make bullets when there was no more ammunition. With the conclusion of the fighting, many women suffered great hardships and had to take care of large families and lead communities as their husbands were either jailed, in risk of being jailed, or dead. Riel relied on women. He would visit Métis women to sit, have tea, and garner their support because without it, he may not have had a provisional government and warriors to stand with him. So he'd go and sit with the Cookums. And he described the Métis nation uh, at times as a pregnant Métis woman in his journals and wrote as a Métis young woman in the poem Je suis Métis, which goes, I am Métis woman and I am proud to be a part of this nation. At Tehran's Kuli, Riel remained at a church in Batash, arms stretched out in the form of a cross praying. When his arms grew tired, he asked the women to hold them in place as he prayed in a trance-like state for hours on end. These narratives of strong women and Riel recognizing his need to get their approval and help are valid as these women had much at stake and were involved in challenging a colonizing government while guiding men. Image. So very quickly, in 2001, uh, I curated this exhibition called Realisms. It was first held at the WEG and later at the Dunlop Gallery in Regina. Uh, I'm just going to show you some images if you want to go back and ask about them. This is the work of Jane Ash Pletras. Um, can you show the next one, please? There were 10 artists of Métis First Nations and Euro-Canadian ancestry in the exhibition. Uh, this is the work um, of Sherry Frell Reset. I'll just let you look at them and answer questions after. Image, please. Image, please. Next. Next. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> they gave me 10 minutes. <laughs> Next. Next. And next. Sorry. I can discuss them further after, I promise. Um, so it plays together in the context of an art exhibition. The artwork exposed the complexities of myth-making, the search for national and cultural icons, and the somewhat forgotten or ignored histories of the Métis. The aim of the exhibition was to facilitate cross-cultural, intercultural dialogues, to raise awareness of Indigenous issues and concerns, and to bridge the cultural divide between systems and institutions such as the WAG, political organizations, the art community, and art theory with Métis people and culture. This would involve holding a culturally relevant opening, film screening, public forum, and national tour of the exhibition. 
I was a 26-year-old woman with visions of grandeur about what art exhibitions can do. During the development stages, I went to different Métis gatherings uh, to discuss the exhibition. I wrote letters to Métis pol uh, political leaders in Winnipeg and spoke with elders. In the spirit of imagined community that surfaces around monuments, I believe that there would be uniform support for the project from the larger Métis community. Uh, I was very naive in that. And although there was much support for the concept and intentions, and the exhibition was viewed by over 20,000 people, several months before the opening, I was alerted that some Métis leaders in Winnipeg were angry. I was warned to cancel the exhibition or allow President um, of the Manitoba Métis Federation, David Chartrand, to choose the artwork that he would like for the exhibition. Um, the WAG, nervous about this circumstance and the lack of official support from certain Métis leadership, not all, they canceled the national tour, all culturally relevant programming, and the public forum. So I, and the very well-intentioned artist, I felt paid the price for my imagination and my visions of, of grandeur. Uh, while the exhibition was up at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, I was asked repeatedly if I had asked the president for permission to organize the show. My response was, I don't ask men for permission. <laughs> I was accused of not being a real Métis because what type of Métis would like this type of art? Uh, <coughs> this, and I cannot stress this enough, was extremely hard on some of my family members. So looking back at these scenarios, I can't help but see engendered response. As a 26-year-old Métis woman, I had stepped where I wasn't supposed to. I was attempting to contribute to a dialogue about Riel that was, at the time, very male-dominated. Image? <laughs> All right, David. <laughs> so I don't have any, um, I, this is so fresh, I just saw it on Sunday, but I really wanted to bring David Garneau's um, piece that he performed last week and ask questions, is it an anti-monument? Uh, is it a call for recognition of Riel in the form of a monument in Regina? And Jimmy, Garn uh, Jimmy Durham's words, David, are really fresh with me, and I'm wondering if we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, how did gender play out or not in David Garneau's performance? So these are some of the questions that are going through my mind right now. Um, and you can explain your work after. And then on the flight here, I was thinking about uh, Métis artist uh, Amy Malbeuf uh, in uh, Montreal last month. She did a performance that I feel uh, we could consider as a gendered anti-monument of sorts, where as a, a young Métis woman, she unraveled a very long uh, ceinture fléchie or Métis sash, folded it up very nicely, and walked in a way that made me think about the quote that indigenous women turn that off. <laughs> indigenous women are the backbone of their nations. And as she walked away with the sense of flesh, she uh, very calmly, um, I got the sense of the embrace that uh, the women who held Louis Riel in a time of prayer uh, contributed in a similar format. Marcy. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, Kathy. And I know it is rushed. We'll have time to revisit that and talk uh, talk further. I should say that Amy is here in the audience as well as uh, uh, well as a number of students and, and profs from uh, UBC Okanagan as well. Um, Kathy, of course, comes to us from uh, University of uh, um, uh, Brandon, Brandon University, where she's teaching the visual arts and the Aboriginal arts uh, department there. Uh, we're going to turn now to uh, Paul Chat Smith, and Paul, of course, is coming to us from the Smithsonian. Uh, uh, a Museum of uh, uh, Na Native Indian Art, and uh, where he's an uh, associate curator. I'll turn it over to Paul. It's so great to be with you here in Saskatoon. <laughs> <laughs> Can everybody hear me loud enough? Okay. All right. This is from 2011. A few years ago, during a period when I wasn't feeling too chipper about the state of things, I watched a cable series called Life After People. The premise was brilliant. What would happen if one day all the humans on Earth just up and disappeared? It was off limits to ask how that would happen, and also what about the bodies and so forth? They vanished too. The show said, basically, look, just play along and pretend that all at once everyone vanished. 
Yes, like the rapture if everyone on earth was a saved Christian and no one was left behind. So each episode of the series used acceptable but not amazing CGI to show a symphony of ruin and decay. The Sears Tower covered with plants and home to various birds and small animals crumbling to the ground or London flooded, zoo animals roaming free, dogs anxiously looking for their owners and so forth. In a shockingly brief amount of time, only a few decades, vegetation makes most cities unrecognizable. Fast forward a hundred years and then a thousand and not just the cities disappear, but nearly all traces of human civilization disappear too under the relentless attack of water, plants, natural disasters, and time. What about 5,000 years? What would, be what would be left to prove humans ever existed? Is everything we ever created merely footprints in the sand? A corny question for the poets, perhaps. And yet, to their credit, life after people actually answers it. And here's the answer, according to their experts, after 50 centuries, all that would tell a visitor from another planet that human beings once existed in this place we call America would be, wait for it, Stone Mountain, Georgia. You will recall that Stone Mountain is a big, mostly granite mountain not far from Atlanta. On its north face is the largest bas relief in the world featuring portraits of the three most famous leaders of the Confederate States of America, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and Jefferson Davis. It was also the spiritual birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan, and Gutzon Borglum, the sculptor, was even a member of the KKK. This was no big deal for white people to be members. The Klan was just another mass organization of the early 20th century United States. Borglum later turned a mountain in the Black Hills, or as the Sioux call it, Paasapa, into Mount Rushmore, featuring four American presidents, which experts say isn't tough enough to last 5,000 years. In recent decades, African American families have colonized Stone Mountain during the summer, and no doubt having many colorful things to say to the Confederate generals who look over their picnics. By the time the earthquake um, in 2011 rattled Washington, D.C., a hurricane named Irene had already canceled the opening ceremonies for the new Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. King referenced Stone Mountain in his most celebrated speech, and in a nice gesture, the officials who oversee Stone Mountain offered their granite for the memorial when it was being built in the early 2000s. Chinese rock was used instead for technical reasons. In 5,000 years, the MLK Memorial will likely be buried under the swamp that will have reclaimed the District of Columbia. Geological time is a useful frame of reference, especially if you're feeling depressed. It'll make you feel even more useless. Or even if you are not depressed, let's just say you're panicked by some meeting next Tuesday, or you've started worrying obsessively about this new scheme the Republicans have to apportion Pennsylvania's electoral votes by congressional districts just in time for the 2012 elections. Granted offers another way of looking at these things. Namely, in the end, we're all dead anyway, so who cares? But humans are a caring species, so looking at things from the point of view of rock only goes so far. 5,000 years is too long anyway. Who really knows what was going on 5,000 years ago? This was even before the Egyptians and the Aztecs, when the Middle Ages were in the distant future. 1,000 years is a better window, I think. Let's rewrite life after people into a premise that says there's no rapture. Instead, humans just keep going on as they always have. In life with people, we can reasonably guess that in 1,000 years, the world will still be basically messed up. And that people in 3,011 will be about as familiar as we are today with the current events of 1011. And here's what I know about life in 1011, nothing. So there you have it, all that survives after 5,000 years is a racist memorial in Georgia. And that's because nothing is stronger than stone. Thank you.
Thanks, thanks so much, Paul. Uh, I'm going to move over to uh, to Jeff Thomason, an artist, a writer, curator, and a, a fixture on the, on the, a scene that uh, that he's he's helped to build. And we'll, we'll be seeing his show tonight. So turn it over to Jeff. Thank you. <coughs> um, images. So okay, I'll just give you a signal when when we move on. <coughs> I. Uh, as Jen was talking about in the beginning in her introduction about um, monuments and how far back it goes uh, for us in terms of sitting in Ottawa at the Samuel de Champlain monument and uh, talking about these things. And I was really curious because there was always this sense that um, Jen was gonna take something away from these conversations and make it into something far more important in terms of reaching an audience, a much larger audience in terms of questioning what these things mean. I've been on this journey for a long time. And when I received the invitation that the conference was going ahead finally, I decided, given the importance of it, that I would write two papers. I never write papers. I speak and I use my images as the point of departure for my presentations. And then I got another email that said, Jeff, you have 10 minutes. <laughs> I said, see, it goes to show what happens when. But what it did for me, the process of looking at exactly at how important monuments have been in my life was very interesting. And so I developed two papers. The first one I'm going to talk about today is essentially talking about my childhood memory. And then tomorrow I'll speak about 1992 and what transpired from that year as well. I was in grade school in the 1960s in Buffalo, New York, and my school had taken a, was making a field trip to the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society. And it was an interesting experience for me, the first time I had been in a museum like that. And the most interesting part though was when we went to the gift shop. And when I walked in, on the right hand side was a photograph on the wall and it showed a monument in Buffalo in the Forest Lawn Cemetery to an Indian. I was really surprised about this because I had seen monuments around Buffalo before that um, to different personalities, none of whom were Indian. And so I thought this is really important but what does it mean? Who is this person? And at that time in my life I was beginning to come of age as an Indian and looking at what was important to me about can you be Indian and live in a city? Do you have to move the reserve? These were all questions that were kind of percolating around but there were no answers for it at the time. And uh, I was very fortunate because my parents had divorced and I was living with my grandmother. And she used to go back to the Six Nations Reserve whenever she had a chance and I often went with her. And I was very fortunate to be introduced to the Longhouse community at Six Nations. And my elder, Emily General, would often hear my kind of questions about what does it mean to, to live in this world in this way? And I remember one of the most important things that she said to me was, don't forget where you come from. Another question, where do I come from? What is my base? And so I had to figure that out. But what I began to realize was that it was the question. It was about keeping the mind active in a way and not letting yourself go silent. So that monument became an obsession for me and I had to see it. And so I went back home after that field trip and I looked on a map and I saw that the Forest Lawn Cemetery where it was located wasn't that far away. So I uh, decided that it was kind of a covert action. I was gonna jump on my little Stingray bike, pedal across Buffalo, get to the cemetery and see Red Jacket for myself. I don't know why it was so important, but it was something that I had to do. So I pedaled across Buffalo, got to the cemetery, to the big iron gates, and I stood there, and I didn't see Red Jacket. But I was too afraid to go in, because I felt that I wasn't supposed to be there, and that if I got caught, I'd get into trouble. So I turned around, went back home, and that was that. But the idea, or whatever that journey planted in my mind, would not die. And so over the years, I continued to ask those, these questions about Indianness and what it meant to me. And this is a painting, a representation of Red Jacket, similar to the figure that was at the top of the monument. He was a very important Seneca chief, part of the Iroquois Haudenosaunee Confederacy, 
and he lived at a place called the Buffalo Creek Reservation, which I found out was buried beneath the south side of Buffalo, New York, which right now is covered with about seven feet of snow. And it was interesting to also have that in mind, that I, was, I could say in my own mind that I was born at the Buffalo Creek Reservation. So how did these things begin to kind of percolate and come into focus? Next to Mitch. So this is the, uh, the image of Red Jacket. Now I'm gonna fast forward here um, to about 1996, 1997. And I received an invitation from Ruth Phillips, uh, art historian at Carleton University, who was working on a large beadwork exhibition. And for some reason, she decided to invite me into the exhibition. And um, I was really curious about why, since I didn't do beadwork. And I had to really think about what I was going to contribute to this exhibition. And so I began thinking about uh, beads and putting together stories and talking about things that are important. What do and then I started thinking about the wampum belt and how important it was to keeping a record of important events that had taken place in Iroquois throughout the centuries. And then I began looking at, um, well, how would I begin to put my wampum belt together? Next to Mitch. And so this, is a, this photograph here shows the, the school that I went to at the time that I was taking that field trip. And I went back... Um, in around 2001 and uh, went to see the old school again. And I was really surprised because this is where I had my first protest. This was the place where I was looking at that question of going back from listening to my elder of the field trip of Red Jacket and who was he and why didn't we learn about him in the classroom. And so I held my first protest at the school and I said that at that time we all had to stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance in the morning and I refused to do it. And I. Um, so there was a commotion about that, and it eventually came about that. I, could, I had to stand, but I didn't have to recite it. But that was the site of my first protest as, as a young boy. And what took place from that point on was this kind of unraveling of this history and the sense of invisibility. And the importance that I wanted to show that image was that when I went back and saw it, that now the, the uh, Buffalo Public School 19 was now a Native American magnet school, and below it, it had the Confederacy flag flying be beneath it. And uh, it was interesting to think about, you know, when we think about monuments in this, and in fact, this was not so much about a monument, but it was about the persistence of resistance that had taken place in me as a young boy. This brought that back, that things do change over a period of time. Next image. This is uh, an example of the wampum belt. When I was thinking about uh, how I was going to incorporate my work into the, into the exhibition, the beadwork exhibition, I began thinking about using the wampum belt as kind of a vehicle of, of coming to some conclusion about my identity and that in each of the symbols on there, I would place a photograph. Next image. And as you can see here, I titled it Cold City Freeze. And the idea was is that I went back to Buffalo when I started working on this project. I completed my journey to the Forest Lawn Cemetery, went inside and found that it was only a couple hundred feet inside the cemetery that Red Jacket was. But it was really interesting to look at that. And then I went to Brantford, Ontario after that, photographed the Joseph Brant Monument, which is next. The next photograph, the one in the center of the wampum belt, actually shows um, a section of where the Buffalo Creek Reservation had been. Um, and I'm worried about time here, so I'm trying to go and keep it all consistent here. But the idea was is that it was about taking a traditional form of commemoration and using it to talk about myself and the complexities of the life that I faced and how I was going to continue to carry on that idea of talking about urban Iroquois people and about how we find our place in that society as well. The monument was a place of departure. It was the question, what does it mean? What does it say? Where do we go from there? And ultimately, it was about um, the search, the journey that still goes on. Now, this rock is very important because when I went back to Buffalo, I found out that Red Jacket had originally been buried at the uh, old Seneca community graveyard. 
So I found the little park where it was at, and there was a boulder there that commemorated the spot where Red Jacket was buried. So I was standing there, and I was taking with photographs, and this guy came over, and he started talking to me, asking me what I was doing. And he started telling me his history, his family history, about how they bought land there when the Buffalo Creek Reservation was broken up in about 1850, 1830, in that period of time, slowly broken up, and that his family bought land there, but they maintained a good relationship with the Seneca people there. And that once they left and they moved to reservations outside of the Buffalo area, that they felt that they wanted to keep that place alive, to keep that memory alive. And that what he used to do was that when kids partied in that park, he used to come over and clean it all up around that boulder to keep that. And then he, I guess he kind of felt like he became the historian of that place. But once again, I think it's really important to think, I haven't come to any answers about what monuments mean or what they say. I think in terms of working with the idea of resistance and keeping that going, it's working in the trenches. And how do we get to that point? How do we get to that point where we do find a sense of meaning? And what's so important today about being here and talking about that as well is also have the exhibition at the Glenbow on residential schools. Because we're talking once again, not about commemoration, but of remembering, of talking, and not letting ourselves go silent ever again. And I think ultimately, this is what the question is. This is the challenge. This is what my elders tried to impart in me, was to not be silent. Donnie. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, I'll move on to, to Jeffrey now, a, a painter, a sculptor, a video maker. Uh, using a combination of traditional and uh, contemporary uh, materials in his work, and, and you can see it next door. And I will turn it over to uh, turn it over to Jeffrey. We're going to start at ten and go backwards. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I sat and I listed, um, reread the questions about monuments and memorials, and and really tried to figure it out. And actually, this morning has really helped quite a bit. Um, so I wanted to, the piece next door is, um, I realized even in my original conversation with, um, with Wayne was somewhat of a proposal in my head and um, thankfully there are curators like Wayne who say like, let's do it. Um, and as we made 30 of those blocks with the help of um, Sophie and Emily and Jake, who I'm not sure is here, who are ACAD students, um, thank you. Um, we made 30 and suddenly I wanted 60 and suddenly I wanted 100 and suddenly I wanted 1,000 and I thought, you know, this would only get better the more that are in the space. Um, but I want to start with this image here, which is, um, yeah, here it is. Okay, so this is Donald Judd's 100 um, aluminum works um, in Marfa, Texas. And um, I wanted to start here to kind of talk about how this became a piece, but then eventually in my mind really is a proposal. Um, when I saw this piece, I went to Marfa with the intention of hating Donald Judd. And, um, and I was like, why do I have this such this vehement like, dislike for him? And I realized it was his position in the art world. And in hearing Jimmy's comments this morning, realizing that it's really um, that position of this heroic white male artist is the monument. It is the cultural monument. And I previously had a hateful relationship with Jackson Pollock, which is the piece that Jimmy refers to. Um, that happened in 2006. And so when I went there, um, I really had every intention of being able to walk around and going like, this is gross, this is horrific. And um, it was completely the opposite. I walked through and I thought what it was, how amazing it was that one single person could have a vision this large and could find a way to enact it. And it suddenly shifted into a very generous um, space for me to experience time, space, reflection, um, to look at the land, through um, a lens of somebody who had constructed an experience for me. And in that sense, um, I realized the, the, the formal qualities of it. And if you haven't been there, and you can go to number nine. Um, if you haven't been there, one of the things that I realized was how much it engages with the light of the space. And it also engages with your psyche of who you bring with yourself when you're there. And so, um, so like I said, I realized there was still this, this kind of formal quality that I've oftentimes felt quite challenged as a self-identified native artist um, and also following around with that question of people saying like, does that pigeonhole you somehow? 
And for me, it's always been something to really carry that title with some sense of ambiguity, some sense of pride, and some sense of determination. Um, so trying to understand minimalism, trying to understand what do these small shifts mean and how do they become generous and how do they make me feel like I can see more in the world was really where I was at at the time when I went to Marfa. Um, this unrelenting ego of somebody who could produce something like Marfa really, um, I realized, was not an option available to me because of coming from um, and having learned of myself as having come from traumatic experiences. And by that I mean my family, my extended family, my mother's family, my father's family. Um, you know, I, I went to school in the 90s, so being inundated with, um, with theories of, of colonizing and, and of course acknowledging um, the colonization that had occurred. So, um, so I think that that was really what my, it was jealousy. I was totally jealous that this here was an artist and a position in the art world that I couldn't occupy. And I couldn't occupy it because of the trauma and my relationship to trauma. So, um, so if we move to number seven. So this is the, um, the memorial in Berlin. Um, memorial, memorial to the murdered, murdered Jews of Europe, designed by Peter Eisenman um, and realized in December 2004. And again, if you haven't visited it, I would recommend anybody see it. And here we have something which is almost equally as formalized, but, um, but honestly, in the experience of it, I found myself, and I'd, I'd been in Berlin as a child, so I remember going to Checkpoint Charlie and being fearful, and I remember they took us into um, concentration camps and they showed us the ovens, and, and as a child, just kind of that being almost unbelievable that humankind or humans could do that, um, and the atrocity of it. And um, so coming and seeing this, this memorial, um, I thought I had, this experience of this very multi-layered experience of looking at a relevant trauma, of course, in the world, and one that could be collaborated or you know somehow parallel to uh, to an indigenous experience in the Americas. Um, and there was something about the scale of it. And here in this image, we're seeing the scale of it. I mean, it, it's saying that it's important. You know, this is the public granting its space to say this is an important subject. This is an important piece. Um, but then as you actually walk through it, if we go to number six, if we actually walk through it, it becomes something that's both dark, playful, communal, um, scary um, as the sun goes down. But what I noticed the combination between experiencing Judd's pieces and this piece was that they were always actively present. They were always responding directly to what's happening in the environment, to the light, to other people being in the space with you. And so there's something about them that made it very present. Um, it was a very present tense self. And I realized that I could see people crying as you walk through this memorial. You could see people playing, children um, primarily. You can see people just in contemplative moments sitting on top of, of these, these concrete slabs. Um, but of course then comes up the irony of why hasn't a monument like this somehow come into existence regarding the experience of indigenous people in the Americas. And um, so that's, the irony of it is really where it kind of hit me. Why can't, why can't our population, why can't our intellectual you know, um, design communities, why can't we come together to find some way of representing this? And, um, and it's, I think there's a lot of reasons. I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, if we look at both of these, there's, there's a heavy um, degree of seriality in terms of the format being repeated, but also being altered. Um, Judd's pieces are a hundred different versions of a very similar uh, format. And so it's really upon reflection that you begin to notice difference. And you're ha you have to walk through, you have to move, you have to look, you have to stay long enough for light to shift. And it's very similar with this, with this monument. Now, of course, there's the argument that, is it specific enough? Are we actually saying who killed the Jews? Who are the specific Jews who were killed? But underneath this memorial, there is actually an archived um, exhibition which gets much more explicit. And so I think what I liked about the Holocaust Memorial is that you're able to approach whatever trauma you have in your life. This becomes some sort of a projection screen for you to kind of have a conversation with and experience with. And um, so after processing some of this, I started thinking about 
how memorials and monuments maybe anger us or relieve us in relationship to where we are in processing our own traumas. So if we can, if we can come to a point of realizing that, I mean, living today is quite traumatic. You know, if we think about everything that we're talking about here today, of course, when we look at, um, just to speak about my own family traumas, um, you know, it's kind of amazing that I'm where I'm at. Like, I kind of am shocked that I was able to, like, come through these immense challenges to my great-grandparents, my grandparents, my mother, my father, boarding school generations, uh, removal acts, um, abuse, physical substance, like the whole lot, um, and still somewhat exists across the board. And what is it that somehow enabled me to not continue to respond from a traumatized place? And part of it has to do with the artwork that I've chosen to make. Um, and we can go to image three. And um, I guess, yeah. So this is the piece next door, which is call and response. And I think, you know, um, one of the things that really became important to me was to try to imagine, when it, once I realized, you know, this is just growing up, that we don't make the best decisions from a, from a state of panic. You know, we don't make the best decisions when we are feeling traumatized and pained. But where is that space that we can actually make somewhat of a, a broad, somewhat objective snapshot of what is the best decision that's actually gonna move myself and my community forward. It's kind of post this intense traumatic situation. And so oftentimes the aesthetic, the beauty in my work has been of criticism, but in speaking to more traditional people than myself, the understanding that beauty or that color and formal choices of design, a simple triangle painted a certain, a certain color can be protection, can be an identifier, can be a communicative tool that um, the hide would have been processed for an individual, by another individual, within a community. These are all telling of um, collaborative roles that make up a unique and um, functional culture or society. So I think that somewhat gave me liberty to think about how the histories that I come from in terms of heritage and ancestry used these materials pre-trauma, pre-trauma before these things happened and how is it that that can um, somehow make me imagine a better place to make a decision from. So that's what my hope was in terms of, and I, and I work quite impulsively, so to choose a commercial cinder block, to wrap it in rawhide, and to choose five, four or five colors to paint um, onto these shapes. It's a very, very simple thing. And I don't, and I think when I was also thinking about memorials, thinking that to throw an image up can sometimes prove distracting or it can prove affirmative in the wrong way. It can make us feel as though we know what we're talking about. It can illustrate our argument, but it doesn't challenge our argument. And so I wanted to also, I'm probably at my time, but I, the last thing I wanna say is that it, Thinking through these ideas really married me back to my um, persistence of the practice of abstraction. And thinking of abstraction as these mechanisms that maybe because we don't understand so coherently, we're able to actually, they act as triggers more than they do as something that's a definitive communicative tool. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, <clears throat> one of the first things they teach you in moderator school is never get between your audience and food. Uh, but, uh, but we are gonna uh, violate that a little bit here today. I know we're running uh, behind time, but this has been such a, a provocative and, and, thought and, and uh, in insightful panel, and we wanna have some time to, to have a, a, a good discussion. Um, I think what we'd like to start with is, uh, is conversations across through the panel and, uh, and then turn it over to the floor to see what, what comes from there. And I wonder if, if we could start with uh, something that, that I was thinking of as, it, it seemed like the entire panel was, was looking at various modes of uh, resistance uh, and um, uh, kind of methodologies, how to, how to move ourselves into, into certain spaces. And uh, I wonder if, Kathy, we could start with you actually because of, uh, uh, you were talking about something very recent which was uh, David Garneau's intervention around Riel. 
and, and you said something very interesting about the question, the questioning of monuments and also the gender politics behind that. So I, I wonder if you maybe would like to start with that, maybe ask, uh, get David involved, uh, because I think that's, uh, that's a key moment that we can, we can start to move from. Well, I'm still wondering in regards to, <laughs> to David's because it's fresh. I think what really, um, from the work I did before, I really felt that there were certain um, situations where many Métis men want to be real, but women want to take care of them. So it was really interesting in regards to David Garneau's performance because there, was, um, there were these moments where he is almost grappling, I felt, and it was about interaction with John A. McDonald, but there were these other narratives happening within that performance where, David, you seem to be struggling and wanting to shed the myth of Riel, which is something to consider for, for Métis people, for Machif people. Our ancestors, our family stories are mere stepping stones up to the myth of Riel. So that myth has such a profound um, impact and it is so very gendered. So there were these moments of trying to shed that, but I kept wondering because of that, um, those stories of uh, Métis women leaders, uh, where now are we in regards to um, dealing with, with the monument and how do, how do Métis women and men working within our milieu have those discussions through now since you went and resurrected Riel again. <laughs> I thought I was so done with this topic. Um, now that you did that to me, <laughs> how do we continue now? Sorry. I'll, I'll try and be brief. So um, there's a narrative that goes from monumental where he's trying to act, trying to be like a monument and imitating John A. Um, but he, as you say, turns his back. He blindfolds uh, uh, John A. And then he turns his back and he does something totally different and the hair goes down. So it's hearkening back to early uh, Riel, those, that early photo in Batoche, I mean in um, uh, oh, the museum across from Winnipeg there, um, uh, St. Boniface, where he's got his hair down and he's with the uh, First Nations people. So I want to go back to that. But in terms of gender, I mean, I thought about it a lot. I mean. You're, you're riding my back all the time, I can't help it. <laughs> and uh, so it's conscious. And so what's really important to me is um, uh, my eldest, uh, B, was in the performance, a transgendered person. And, you know, if, if being Métis isn't mixed up enough, you know, that you've got this. So um, I was, I, B went and worked with um, Roy Bison's son, Teddy Bison, to learn the drum, learn the teachings of the drum, and which, he uh, started off by saying, you know, uh, women aren't allowed to do that. Of course, B just smiles. <laughs> and so getting that permission to then use that was very important because uh, B begins and ends. But also, as, as you know, in the performance, it ends. He's uh, gradually changing from this sort of monumental or, or from real and turns into me. And then I pick up my cell phone and call my wife to pick me up. Everything's OK. So it's by the way, and it's not good enough for sure. Um, but I also want to thank you for uh, evoking uh, Eleanor Garneau's presence back there too, <laughs> that good story. Well, it's so interesting for me because um, my own personal family narratives, I'm from a Métis family where we don't attempt ever to trace uh, our lineage, at least my immediate family, to Louis Riel, which is very common in Manitoba. Everyone tries to connect in some way, shape, or form. My family doesn't. Um, we have narratives about the more immediate family, but what that means is we don't ha we don't have discourse about Eleanor Garneau in my in my family. I thought, oh my gosh, David, you have gold. That's a that's amazing. You have one of those few known stories about Métis women who calmly sheds and washes something. Her husband would have been executed if those documents would have been found. So you get on that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if the other panelists have anything to say about this, this very interesting notion of resistance uh, through recuperation or resistance through, uh, through, through memory and relearning, as, as some of you have talked about. You know, I'll add a bit more about, the, about the re why Red Jacket was so important, is that when I used to go stay at, on the reserve with my, with my elders, um, she, Emily General, had also been an activist during much of her life. Uh, she was one of the women that was behind the council door when it was broke down by the RCMP in 1924 when they instituted the elective system. So when I was there and I listened to her stories, they were always about activism. But there was also another side of her that was, um, uh, she formed the first um, theater company in the 1960s at Six Nations. 
And uh, what they used to do was to put on plays about um, heroes in our culture. And Red Jacket was one of them. So it was kind of a, a interesting relationship that, um, and why he became so important to me and, uh, and how that was transmitted to me in terms of uh, what was going on. Because I, I was remembering that she used to always try to enlist me to, to take part in the plays. And, and I was so shy at that time that um, I had to find ways of uh, refusing her that became quite creative as well. Um, but it was still the sense of, um, of imparting that sense of resistance through the play. And you have to remember that during that period of time to talk about indigenous heroes was unheard of. She had uh, been a teacher on the reserve. Um, after she had graduated from uh, from college and uh, was um, fired uh, after she refused to sign the oath of allegiance to the queen. So um, she also had that sense of, um, of being a teacher in her background as well, which was all communicated to me. But it all came down to that one stream of thought about resistance and how do we go about doing it. And certainly having a play talking about indigenous leaders was one way of doing that. Um, my step-grandfather took me back into the bush one day to show me where the first uh, theater company used to perform. It was way back in the bush. And he didn't tell me why at that time, but when I started working on residential schools, I began to understand why that play was so far back in the bush. Um, Maria, I wonder if you could uh, add to this about this, this reconceptualizing of the hero, considering what you've, you've shown us here. Uh, yes, um, I did a work in uh, 92 about uh, Tupai, who was a Guarani leader. Uh, I had interviewed him earlier in about 82, 81, and uh, he was uh, in Mato Grosso do Sul, uh, in a reservation very far away from town, and he led a resistance against the landowners, and um, I was asking him, how do I uh, proceed with uh, uh, trying to organize an indigenous national uh, organization in Brazil. And uh, he was my mentor. And then he was assassinated in 83. Uh, and uh, I have always kept trying to figure out for a while how to deal with this. So later I went to um, a place in the north of Mato Grosso uh, do Sul and there there was water lots of water and six months of the year the water just rises and rises and it gets to the top of, to the shoulders of the cows and what happens is you don't see the fence lines but you see the cows marching along and then you know where the fence line is and uh marcel de souza he uh, as his portuguese known name he was um, angry at the division of the land of the Guaranis by the landowner with the fence line. And he pointed to me the original uh, uh, mountains that defined the area for them, which was beyond their, uh, they could not have access to because now it was a white rancher's land. And so I had that photograph and I made it large and I took it to that place where there's the uh, high waters and I made photographs of the fences and then I put the uh, photographs of the fence on wood and I put it into the mud near where the rising waters was coming. And I had um, the photo of Tupai and the mountain and the fence line, along with other photos of fence lines throughout a little shack. And then I um, did an exhibit there and it's a big installation. And then I left the photos of the fence line to be um, covered over by the co oncoming waters so that the fences would be buried. But I took Tupai's photograph away. Um, I wanted to show him uh, the disappearance of these um, fences that were dividing up in the uh, native lands. So that's why I, I was trying to figure out how to deal with uh, the memory of an important uh, leader uh, and how to make it active within a community still. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, uh, Paul or Jeffrey, any, any further comments on, on this? I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey? Um, I'll just say, I mean, uh, I mean, learning resistance and stuff, one of the biggest things I learned was when people would talk to me about their faith in making things, people who are making traditional things for um, traditional events. And that's really what was, was a huge turning point for me, was just to realize that um, you know, I went through formal art education, but we never talk about faith. We never talk about the belief that you can make something that's capable of 
generating something beyond its material quality. And that was probably one of the hugest lessons and probably resonates the most with thinking about how to reconnect. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Paul, do you want to further, uh, you were talking, you had this interesting notion of, of survival, what survives uh, the, 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 the human existence. Do you have any, anything further to talk, talk about that? Because a, a lot of questions around resistance are often around survival as well. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think to talk about memorials um, and monuments, it's obviously you're talking about a narrative, right? Ultimately, you have a narrative, and then you're choosing what to remember and forget. So I'm, I'm interested in that, um, I would say over the last uh, several years, there's been growing momentum for the, the primary way to understand the Indian experience in the US and Canada um, is through the idea of genocide. And I'm interested in that, and I think it's something that really needs to be explored um, in depth. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Indian space is that, you know, we're, I mean, on a planetary level, what are we? We're like the biggest losers in the history of the world, right? Where we had all of this stuff and we lost virtually all of it. Most of us are killed. This is, again, the, the general narrative. And, of course, we qualify that in different ways. But it, it's interesting to me um, that, in fact, you know, there are more, there are more, uh, there was a, there was this movie called um, Dog Soldier, I think, and it was about, it imagined some Cheyenne folks who had escaped, it's a Hollywood movie. Um, somehow we're still living in present day, in the 20th century. And um, the whole idea of that movie was how amazing that was, that they would still survive and how threatened they would still be. And, and yet, I end up thinking a lot about how there are more Cheyenne people today than there have ever been in history. Cheyenne people are doing amazing things all over the world. They're flying airplanes, they're writing books, they're doing all these things. So there's something about the, the, the loser victimization narrative that I think we need to really think about more um, in terms of you know, how, we, how we play into that idea and what the costs are. Um, and I think uh, there's a larger issue of just how the, the, the immensity of the experience of the last five plus centuries to try to narrow that down, to try to explain it, to try to compare it to other catastrophes in world history. I think it's too big. I think it's too big. I think we need a new language. I think we need new ideas to talk about that. And that some of it was not in fact about colonial governments or intentional campaigns. Um, and I think we're losing out on trying to understand for ourselves and then be part of a broader dialogue about what that experience was about. Yeah, I totally agree with what Paul's saying. And I think the thing is, is that that can't come with a new sense of morality. Um, that, that almost is what almost defines a, a failing monument today, is that it's such a specific morality that I think is what triggers people to either hate it or to kind of be affirmed by it. Thank you. Um, we've got this uh, wealth of knowledge and experience, I think, uh, in the audience. We have students, we have artists, we have intellectuals. And um, I'd like to take this opportunity to turn it out to the audience because, uh, uh, because of all you can give. I know, you know Raymond's brought uh, his group here from Banff and there are students and, and people from all over the, the country and the world. So I, I'd like to turn it to this. Please uh, feel free to address it to a specific panelist or make a general comment and, uh, and see what we can do. And I think we'd like to go to about 1.30 uh, with this so we have a bit of time, if that's, if that's all right with you. So, Trevor. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm Trevor Bodie, I'm a critic from Vancouver, and thank you for organizers and Ashok for the uh, management this morning. Uh, I have questions for two of the panelists on uh, around a kind of missing theme in the presentations. Um, uh, first, uh, Maria Alves, muito obrigado por su palestra, muy muy interesante. I'm uh, my question for you is. Uh, I went to Paraguay. I gave a talk in Paraguay last fall. Paraguay is a very interesting instance, and it's no paradise. But as you know, uh, Guarani is the national language, one of them. Uh, the, the currency is called the Guarani. Um, and I saw absolutely no um, monuments to the, I'm an architectural historian, I saw no monuments to the equivalent of the Benderantes 
in Paraguay. Now, so it seems to me like a particular Brazilian, um, maybe even Argentinian discourse to celebrate uh, these people. Um, but it seems to me the other half of that colonization, of course, was the church, was the Padre Catolicos, uh, Jesuiticos, you know. Uh, they were the passive, if you want, by your analysis, colonizers, and the active violent ones were the Bandorantes. So, uh, you know, in your analysis of, of, for example, U.S. cavalry, as a kid growing up in Edmonton, I wore one of those hats. As a kid growing up in Edmonton, I also wore a Davy Crockett hat. As a kid growing up in Edmonton, I could not wear a Mountie hat because they were not available. Uh, but uh, in any regard, I'm just wondering about the missing terms of, of the re religious dimension of colonizing spirit. There's lots of monuments to uh, Jesuit priests and church, et cetera, but that, uh, it seems that the religious term was excluded from your analysis, and then I'm gonna make the same question to Kathy in a second. Okay, um, I wasn't excluding it uh, uh, at all. It was just that I was taking the different myths that the countries define themselves by. And so it was like the cowboy, uh, the settler pioneer, and then, and the bandera, but uh, it, where I'm from in Brazil, uh, I'm just, just visiting it in September for a show, and they have a new monument <laughs> where they have a statue in the in the beach of uh, of a Portuguese uh, colonizer, uh, the priest known as Anchieta, and uh, the Tupinamba uh, native person. And they're all happy together and shaking hands. Um, so there is, uh, and it's a false history altogether because uh, Anchieta was uh, the priest uh, sided with the Portuguese colonizer to destroy these people. Uh, so uh, my idea of the church uh, policy in Brazil um, has been that, of course, it's that same, uh, the, the diplomacy of the church coming in. First you send the gun and then you send the church and then you get total um, brainwashing going on there. Um, an interesting thing that I've just found out very recently, this is an aside, but I think an important aside, um, there is, uh, they came out uh, on a statistic of how much money the government in Brazil is giving towards food baskets to guarantee that anyone that earns below the minimum wage has enough to eat. So it's a food basket that you get every month, which uh, has changed the Brazilian body uh, which is now a, not a body that's uh, in massive starvation, but has actually some muscles, and uh, which is gives a different view of, of Brazilians. And uh, it's the same amount of money that the Brazilian Catholics give to the church as charity. So that means at any time during these 500 years that the church has been in Brazil, we could have had much less starvation at any time. Uh, so I thought this was... Um, a very clear uh, indication of what has been happening with the church in uh, the Americas. Uh, thank you very much. A uh, quick follow-on to, to Kathy. Um, as I understand from a distance, a lot of the controversy about the LeMay sculpture was its attempt to represent Riel's mysticism and sensuality. Now, do you sublimate those into a gendered analysis? In other words, is mysticism and sexuality by terms of your analysis, gendered, or was, is that just a, another term of analysis? Oh, geez, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if the LeMay uh, monument was necessarily about his sexuality, although it certainly became, um, because of location, um, because of his genitals being lobbed off, because of um, homophobia in Winnipeg, it's, there certainly became um, a certain discussion of sexuality around it. Uh, the mysticism, as far as being gendered, I think that's more possible and, and plausible around uh, the myth of Riel and the way that he's spoken about. Um, I think certainly sharing that narrative about women holding him up. Um, his discussion or discourse that Sherry Farrell reset uh, represents in her artwork about death being a Métis woman, um, the Métis nation being a Métis woman. Um, there, there are recognitions of, of gender within his mysticism, but ultimately there's something quite patriarchal about it. 
and in how politicians like Jean Lard, like David Chartrand, like Billy Joe Laurent, the way they presented themselves in the controversy, there seemed to be something of wanting to emulate his mysticism in their discourse. And I want to give you one example. Um, when uh, when Jean Lard chained himself to the sculpture, he made this statement, this is part of our history, and he would not declare himself as Métis, only Manitoban, because he was an NDP MLA. This is part of our history. There has been 25 years of turmoil over this monument, and it is part of our history, and it shouldn't be taken away. Uh, he stated, um, I will talk to the police when they come, the Lord will provide. Mm -hmm. So I found that really emulating Louis Riel's discourse. So. I think there's a question at the back, Tannis? Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. I think there's always a problem with language, right? Like I think a lot of people think of monument in Western terms of reference, um, icon, idol, like something to be worshipped. Um, but I look back at it Indian art history and I don't see this type of meaning, right? And I see monuments more as actions, like our monumental survival, our continued existence as monument to the power of our resiliency and resistance. And I think we're much like the dwarfs that Jimmy was talking about, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I like how we keep bouncing back. But then also like the Nishiu walkers, you know, where I think the monument is testament to the importance of the act of our culture for survival. And then I think of Yes Bodek, who was breaking the copper in all of Rebecca Belmore's works. And I wonder, so I have a question in two parts. Do you think that in reinventing the monument, that we can make both autonomous and community-based actions the basis of our monument? And, uh, and if so, also thinking in terms of the dams in Brazil and other Western monuments that kill, what type of momentous, momentous sovereign actions or counteractions do you think are needed to better assist a particular land or people? Miigwech. Don't ask easy questions, Dennis. Uh, <laughs> who would like to be first at that one? Um, can I maybe, um, and hope I'm translating this right, Tannis, um, the idea of re reinventing um, in regards to autonomy and community base. Uh, I think I, in like 10 seconds, mentioned Amy Melbeuf's performance that she did at Concordia University. And for me, in regards to her unraveling that very long Métis sash, folding it up and walking away very calmly with it, uh, for me, that exemplified that autonomy and community-based um, focus and the potential of performance art, of challenging certain Western notions of, of monument. Um, and as a Métis woman, I, I could see it as being relevant and translated into my own family and our family uh, without um, there being those binaries or the, that level of discomfort with contemporary art that happens among the, the Machif nation. So I don't know if I've answered that, but I wanted to mention Amy Melbeuf's work and um, how I'm contemplating about it, which might be in connection with that. Oh, no, I totally agree. She's our cousin too, eh? My <laughs> cousin. <laughs> Without putting you on the spot, Amy, do you want to uh, respond to the idea of your performance as monument? The mic's just uh, behind you there. Hmm. Um, I guess when I was creating that, I was thinking about, I guess, our elision as in Indigenous women. Indigenous people have been omitted from history, but uh, particularly the women. Um, and I think, you know, the Metis Sash is kind of. Um, an icon or a monument of Miti culture. And so I wanted to, um, I guess, reclaim um, that for the women and kind of connect it to, um, you know, we do, we're leaders as well, and we're, we're laborers, hard laborers. We work really hard, harder than the men, I think. Um, and um, and we, we sewed everything. We made all these tools possible for the men um, and so I guess I was just thinking about, um, you know, aligning ourselves with that uh, as a woman um, carrying the culture. Um, so aligning, aligning the women with these icons and that history. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Amy. Any other comments from the panel or questions uh, from the floor? There's a question uh, down here, uh, Wayne. 
Hi, thank you for this very inspiring and uh, enlightening uh, conference and conversation. My name's Catherine, I'm from the Edmonton Arts Council, and my question is to you as Aboriginal artists and uh, perhaps anti-monument makers. Uh, the Edmonton Council has an interest in um, finding out what kind of commemoration the Aboriginal cultural of cultures, I suppose, of Alberta would be interested in as a remembrance somehow of the TRC events that have just gone through Canada. And I'm wondering if as a group you're even interested in government support of an, a monument or an anti-monument and what that might look like to you. Jeff, I wonder if you could uh, speak to, I know your work was, uh, which you'll see at the Glenbow, was at the, the first TRC and uh, National Gathering, and, and any comments about the, the notion of monumentalizing uh, the ideas around, uh, around the TRC? Well, one, one thing I know that's happening in a lot of communities, well, maybe not a lot, but some are beginning to build their own monuments in terms of uh, commemorating uh, the residential, exp residential school <coughs> experiences in their, in their specific communities. So there's a lot of grassroots um, uh, action that's beginning to take place in consideration of how do we begin to, um, to uh, remember these things that have taken place. Surprisingly, a number, uh, it seems to be growing, and I hear uh, quite often of a new community that's, that's considering a monument. And I think that th it's always uh, you know, subjective in terms of um, what the particular community wants to do in terms of um, how they uh, want to commemorate, like in Ottawa, we have the uh, National Aboriginal War Memorial, and which certainly was uh, commissioned by Aboriginal veterans. It was a, a Cree artist from Saskatchewan that did the work on it, and um, the opening event in Ottawa was attended by, by um, Indigenous uh, war veterans from across Canada. And certainly you could talk about the monument in terms of its aesthetic and where it was coming from and maybe what it was kind of, had it moved or shifted from the typical kind of commemorative monument, but the, part, the point was is, is, that, uh, is that it was surrounded by Aboriginal veterans that were there and it was important to them. So I think that it's an individual community kind of event that takes place in terms of, well, what do we want to do? Um, is it just simply a place of, of coming to be able to, to make an offering, as simple as that? Does it have to be a big stone structure? No, it doesn't, but it's something that where people can more or less vent to say that, um, uh, to recognize that these things have happened. And um, I think it's beginning to expand and, and take different shapes across the country. And in terms of, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about when they had the shooting on Parliament Hill is that um, I'm gonna show an image tomorrow that has a carved Indian head in front of the center block. And behind it, there's a bullet hole in the window. And they're talking about whether or not they should leave the bullet hole in the window to commemorate that event. And I was thinking how ironic it is in one way, a sense, I think, to think about that the photograph that they used to illustrate it was a carved Indian head, and right behind it is the bullet hole in the window. And I thought, well, let's get realistic and talk about other things as well. Can we do that? Do we take the initiative to do that? And I think that's the important thing, is whatever it is, whatever shape it takes, is what we make of it. And we come back to survival. And we talk, yes, we have survived, but how well? And where are we going to take this? And the thing is, is will we take it from here and will we go into our communities and will we begin talking about these things to the people that need to hear it as well, which are the children. And the fact that us as artists and as thinkers and as writers, that's our responsibility as well. So, I mean, we can build something, but you know, we have to take the action as a community of people to make sure that it resonates and that it speaks and that it's heard. <laughs> Just as you were speaking, Jeff, I was thinking that uh, one of the, um, and thinking of the TRC, and when uh, Harper made his apology, one of the, the, the troubling moments in that was him talking about closing, closing that sad chapter. And I wonder, do you think that monuments run the risk of, uh, in their, in their um, imposition, I suppose, 
of, um, of closing that history to say, well, this is it, we've done something, and now we don't have to do anything more. Is that a question to me? Sure, or Paul. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> well, I think if you ask a lot of people, it just opened up the door. Because for Indigenous people, it opened up the door. It wasn't a closing door. And uh, certainly from, from, from Harper's perspective, he may have thought that he was closing the door and kind of you know, kissing it goodbye and sending it on its way. But in fact, what's happened is you look at like, uh, movements like Idle No More, and that the thing is is that uh, you know, it's, it's called into question. Some people may feel that it was appropriate to hear that apology and that we can move on. I don't think so. I think it just kind of established, once again, the kind of issues that we're dealing with in terms of also looking at monuments as well, is that, you know, it says one thing, but what is it, what, what's really taking place here? And is the apology enough from the Prime Minister of Canada? Hell no. You know, it's, but we, but once again, I keep on coming back to this, the same point, is that we have to ensure that, um, that the momentum takes place and goes in the direction that it should go from there. That's our responsibility. Uh, Luke? Could I address something real quick on that sure question? I, I appreciated the um, question about government funding. And I was remembering what um, Margaret Waterchief was saying this morning about, you know, very frankly acknowledging, you know, her reserve is at Weaver Ward, so almost entirely dependent on government funding. You know, I would suggest most of us, including, you know, a, a Native art world I know pretty well, including our best Native intellectuals, are also overwhelmingly dependent on government funding unless one imagines the most elite universities in Canada and the U.S. are not somehow part of the nation states in some way, which our theory says they are. So I just want to sort of put that out there, that I see very few artists that can claim I will not touch anything that's related to, to that funding. I think it's just a reality. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, I suppose I, I, I really see the... the the concept of the monument as a as a sort of uh, form of of aesthetic survivability. It's the, the the attempt to maybe take some of these ideas of survival and put them into non-human matter. Um, but there there seems to lie a, a problem here. I think between the the desire to have a generic monument that ha that invites a kind of unreflexive empathy. I mean, th that's one of the things that minimalism does well, is, is you, you can project almost anything into it, but its stakes are quite low. It, it doesn't work as a sort of truth act because it's not dangerous in any way. It doesn't force a kind of, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't force speech, it doesn't force discourse. It, it really can please anything, and I, I know, I know the, the Berlin Monument, uh, that is one of, its, one of its many criticisms of the Holocaust Memorial. Um, my question is really is, is to do with um, uh, pronouns, because I, I think un under this, 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 this broad idea of the monument, of the vision, we, we, throughout the talk, this, this idea of we kept coming up, but um, uh, and, and already we, we've had an amazing kind of proposition of solidarity from Jimmy Durham. But, but I don't, I know like from my own community there, 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 there is a complexity that that pronoun will never fully encompass. A and so um, I see, uh, I see like the proposition out of this panel at least coming in, in terms of the, the, the the amount of problems that occur around the Real Monument, just of the single act of trying to make it a memorial dedicated to one figure, who is of course an index for many figures. So it, my question is very vague, but uh, well what I'm really asking about it is, well, how do we re c constitute this we, first of all? And, and it, are monuments even a place where one can constitute a we, critically? Yeah, I mean, I'll just speak to say that I don't think that a public work generally generates um, critical, you know, the sort of conversation that we're having here. I think when you um, come into, you know, just the, the very process of proposing something and getting it through and the finances and everything like that, everything eventually becomes a compromise at the end. So I think for me, the, um, the function of a public work is um, never going to be the most kind of 
you know, critical, um, confrontational work that's not really what's ever going to make it through to the end. So, but on the other hand, I think as an artist, that's just one option of where you might function. So I think something, um, and I'm really sorry, I'm not familiar with your performance piece that's been discussed, but, um, you know, I think that it's really powerful when somebody self-generates and self initiate something totally independently outside of um, a proper art world system. And that probably actually has the most confrontational, um, most um, highest level of, of intervention that maybe provokes, you know. But that's also the huge part of that is that you're not requesting permission. And, um, and that's huge. So I think sometimes the art world gets confused and we, we get kind of like caught up in, in criticizing one format or one element in the art world, but they're really just a million options as to where you can find ways to put. And some expressions belong in public monuments and they're always going to be somewhat of a populous thing, you know, and that can function well within that context. And then I think um, a really provocative intervention um, can be hopefully at its best it can be exactly that and it can really provoke a conversation that wouldn't happen otherwise but that's you know and I, you know it's funny I, like this isn't really to like be super critical of this but we really are we're in a college you know many of us flew in this really is one of the most formalized western formal ways of having a conversation around culture so I think we kind of have to remember that like we're all implicit in this problem and, um, and including myself. And so in being here, hopefully the idea is really just to, you know, take the opportunities that are here. And I think Paul brings up, I think money, which is a huge thing, which I hope gets addressed even further during this next few days. Um, but that implicitness is key to, to this conversation and really who gets represented and whose voice is seen without compromise. It's interesting with the the Riel monuments in Winnipeg, it's almost overwhelming how much people's identity of being becoming Métis were bound up in that LeMay sculpture and then the removal, the relocation and the resurrection. So in the case of our nation, it very much reflected our engagements with the nation state that is Canada. So that's something that really became quite obvious and, and shows the problematic and and how the discourse that comes from that nation state can really impede the discourse within our own nation. And I think that certainly um, is my concern. But that abstracted sculpture, you know, when Jean Lard chained himself, you know, the answer of why they chose that, that monument came through and that was he knew that was going to create a lot of dialogue and debate um, and anger. And I think he knew it was gonna angry other Métis people because we have our own internal politics uh, in, in Manitoba. And so he knew that dialogue and discourse was gonna happen and it was gonna be problematic and it was gonna make people angry, but it would move us forward in um, becoming and, and being who we are as Métis people. Um, and it's unfortunate, though understandable to an extent, why it was replaced with the banking image of, of a banker, like where that came from. That was an assertion of Métis nationhood, but it was an assertion in the form of the nation state depiction. So what do, what do we do now? So I'm very glad um, that Amy did her performance and that David Garneau did his performance, because these are performances, though if a lot of Métis elders saw David with the, the noose and the hat, they, they might have left, to be honest, right? It would have been an issue, but there's some openings happening. That, so I feel these monuments are important to continually discuss and, and contemplate anti-monuments or, or indigenizing. Make sense? We can't, I don't wanna be done with them yet. <laughs> I think in the interest of time, uh, we're gonna move to Maria for one last comment, but I, I just want to, to follow up on what Jeffrey was saying about, uh, about, in a sense, the institution as a monument and to, to know that uh, we'll move from here into lunch and uh, that does give us, a, give us an opportunity. Please corner these really wonderful panelists and talk to them then and there because over food we can, we can come to conclusions that are I think a lot more progressive and, and politic than sitting in a lecture hall. But let's move over to Maria for a last comment, please. 
Um, well, Ashoki, you had uh, mentioned earlier the problematics of the title, Who's Heroes? And I agree with you because once we start saying who's heroes, I cannot be as generous as uh, Poti Poran was in the video uh, where um, she talks about the European settlers in Brazil and their point of view. I think when we are talking about uh, the Bandeirantes, there is no uh, possibility of this gray area that they might have been heroes because that they were defined by the, their killing. So um, it's an obscenity to um, allow an escape valve in that situation. Thank you so much. Uh, please, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Maria, Kathy, Jeffrey, Paul, and Jeff.